Gemini 23, three fledglings in a nest high in a tree. These young chicks are high. They're away from the dangers of the world. They're young. They've just been born. They can't even feed themselves. They need an agency, the mother, to, to give them life. They would not survive without that. And <clears throat> we're examining here what happens when we have an idea, the very first seed of an idea, not yet germinated into something that could be real, and how we need to treat that idea. And the idea here is that the fledglings are equivalent to the idea, and we need to treat it the way a mother treats her children, her offspring. And we're studying the beginnings, the very beginnings of spiritual integration. A mind that works properly has balance. It is not entirely rational. It is not entirely intuitive. Either state of being brings an imbalance in the mind, in the thinking processes, in the way, therefore, that we externalize who we are. We're, we're out of balance then. And the mindset that brought about the, the Western world, the successes, the achievements, is largely left brain, it's largely logical, and it looks for the purpose of a point. An idea must have a goal and, and be achieved in the world. And, and so the modern era has been typified by having done that, having brought profound ideas to bear upon the nature of reality and made changes in the world according to this ability of the mind to create substance out of thought. And yet, look at what we've done with it. We understand how energy and matter are actually interchangeable through Einstein's equations. And yet, we've used that, first and foremost, to build a nuclear bomb. It's what we do with ideas in the, the modern era in the West. And that's not okay. That's an imbalance of mind. However, you meet nowadays the mirror reflection of that, the contrast to that in the form of hippies and New Age people uh, who just use intuition in order to claim knowledge. They, they jump to conclusions without checking out whether or not their ideas have got foundation. And there are many astrologers that fall into that category that say things that just don't check out in any way. And this is part of the reason why astrology has not gained mainstream acceptance, is because astrologers just don't think in the same way that the mainstream is structured. But if you have an idea, it needs to check out. It needs to be consistent with other ideas. It needs to be defensible. If there's an argument, you can actually come up with a counter-argument. You can prove your point. You can base your premise, your first axiom, on an empirical event. You can say, look, that's what's happening, and then this occurred. You can study the relationship between, for example, in this case, astrological transits and events in history. And when you do that, it does check out to some extent, but not to the extent that the pink and fluffies want to claim. If you look back in history at what happened when Pluto was in Capricorn, you will see that certain patterns evolve. If you do a statistical analysis of 25 million bits of data, which I have, according to which is the safest motorist on the road, you'll find that the safest motorist and the most dangerous motorist are in opposing signs. And the second most safe and the second most dangerous are in opposing signs. Really clear evidence of the existence of astrology. Scorpio's safest, incidentally. And when you study, and this is interesting, the same data for who went abroad for their holidays, Sagittarius and Taurus are outstandingly obvious. They feature, 
And yet astrologers would be certain that Sagittarius would be the traveler on holiday and a Taurus would be the stick at home. It is the very reverse. Think about that. Astrology proven to exist because of the correlation is very demonstrable. But also what is proven is that astrologers haven't understood astrology properly. So what we're studying in this particular degree is what you do with an idea. You get given, maybe, this, this idea. You get inspired and you have a thought. What do you do next? And the suggestion here is that you need to go through a process. You need to cherish that idea as though you were a mother cherishing fledglings in the nest. So, keeping that idea high above the world in this high nest that means you don't talk about it yet. You, you meditate on it, you think about it, you, you do some research, you check it out. You, you just see whether or not the idea has substance, whether it's just a fancy. And you don't act upon it yet, you don't take it into the world yet, because it's just not validated. What you have to do with any idea is to validate it before you put it into the world. Because the world is rough and dangerous and will take your nascent idea, which is not yet properly formed, and they will bend it out of shape. They will corrupt it. They will take out the light of it. That's the warning here. So rather than put the thought into the world in order to be attacked and ridiculed and for your faith in that thought to be diminished, it is suggested that you find a way to back it up, to give it substance, to give it the power of potential. And that means you have to refine it. And there's a difference between feeling a thought, having the thought, and giving voice to the thought. We need to give this a lot of consideration. I perhaps teach a principle to a student and they say, ah, oh, yeah, I know that. And they do know that on one level, if, in the sense that if I say something and they feel agreement, then they know that on the level of feeling. However, it's probably the first time that they've actually shaped that feeling with words. So if I present words to a student, then the feeling of agreement is there, and now it's shaped into concepts, which moves into a different part of your being. Maybe the heart or other centers have the sense of feeling, of knowledge. But until you actually put it into the shape of thoughts and words, and something that can be written down, then it doesn't gain form, not really. Feelings are amorphous and, and generally without form. Thoughts are very specific. They center around particular choices of words in a particular order. The presence and the absence of adjectives and semicolons and all these details that you have to work out when you write something down, that changes your appreciation of the thought you're having. That's another dimension above feeling when you can think at that level of clarity. So we, we take it to that level, but there's another level. If you then present that thought to the world and you say, this is what I think, you need to back it up with a different level of your own power. And, and then you can see how the potential for a thought, which begins as a feeling, then becomes a sharpened conceptual thought projected into the world where it actually suffers the slings and arrows of commentary from others, blame, attack, criticism, refutation. And, and you have to be strong enough to say, yes, you've made a good point there, I will change my mind. Or, no, I think you'll find this, that and the other backs up my argument. You have to be able to do that. You have to defend your thesis, or your thought will not go into the world. It will just dissipate, as so many thoughts do.
So I think this degree is telling us that that process by which the feeling becomes a thinking, becomes a expressed thought, that process can be anticipated. We know that will happen. And therefore, what we need to do before we launch that thought into the world is to to, to take a, a detached perspective. And, and this is granted through meditation. And, and just to move above your investment, your emotional investment in this thought being a good idea, just move above that and check out whether or not actually it is, you know. And you move into this place of higher vision, super vision, supervision. You supervise your own thoughts. This gives you a potential for being both author and editor of all that you do simultaneously. How is this different in any way from reflexive self-consciousness? It isn't. This is the whole point of, of our spiritual journey, to develop reflexive self-consciousness, to see ourselves from the other's point of view. And if we do that with our own thoughts, we edit our own thoughts before presenting them to the world, we've got this sense of supervising ourselves, then we move into a higher dimension of consciousness. If you try and present um, a work of, of art or a work of thinking, philosophy or whatever to the world, and you have not done that, it will either it will be either shot down by the intelligentsia or willy-nilly accepted by the sheep. It won't achieve the purpose that you're looking for. What we try to do as teachers and inspirers and leaders and explainers at whatever level we're operating and to whomever we're presenting ourselves, what we try to do is to awaken a new perception. If we don't do that, then we haven't done anything. You have to awaken a new perception in someone. Make them think differently. It doesn't matter whether they agree with you or not. Movement moves people towards wisdom stuckness doesn't. So what we're trying to do is to say, you think this, but what about this idea? And, and oh, okay, you don't think that way anymore. I don't care which way you do think, particularly, you might want to agree with me, fine. You might want to disagree with me, also fine, provided it's not holding on to a stuck position. So that's what we're doing as teachers. We're trying to awaken new perceptions in people. To do that, we have to make sure that our presentation is robust. Now, the content of what we say is secondary, but it needs to be carefully worked out by the process that we've been discussing. And yet the, the power of the message comes in tone. And even though we have faith in our idea at the beginning of this process. It just pops into our head and we think, oh yeah, I like that idea. So we've got enthusiasm and some faith that it's meaningful. That's nothing compared to what you can have by checking out what other people have said, thinking about it clearly, discussing it, debating it in, in your inner circle, and just really finding out that what you think is the case before you go and present it to the world. Now then, when you do present it, there's this sense of confidence, gravitas, authority that backs up what you say. I know what I'm talking about. I know you haven't studied this question as much as I have. Nobody has. When you've got that kind of authority, then something about what you're saying carries weight. It makes a difference. And you get other people to give you a chance and they'll think about what you're saying. They'll challenge it maybe with what they're thinking too, but they'll, they'll change their perspective. They'll see things differently because you have been diligent enough to put weight behind your idea. So what we see then is, is the idea of the, the three fledglings being fed by the mother and protected by being high up. So your ideas, many of them, three of them, not one, three, lots, um, all of your ideas are best kept out of 
worldly attention until you can feel that sense of authority and present them to the world. Now this is so, so different from how most people are with their words. They throw them away as though they were ten a penny, you know, and, and that's what they become. People speak as though their words aren't important and therefore their words become unimportant. There are other people that just deliberate before they speak and then you listen to them. So maybe we're one way with our social life and another way with our working life. You know, we don't have to be the same way with all of it. But if you actually want to be heard, there's a process that you go through to get the right kind of attention in order that your words will be taken seriously. And it's to do with silence, partly. It's to do with breathing, partly. You just say, look, I'd like to say something to you. This is what I think. You change your manner of presentation and then you get the attention necessary to receive your idea. That's a part of this process, the nest that we need to hold our ideas basically represents whomever we're speaking to, the listener. And if the listener doesn't want to hear you, is not interested in what you have to say, you can't deliver the idea. It won't get delivered. You're, you're wasting your time and worse, you're diminishing your own confidence in your word. Now, of course, this degree will express itself very differently according to which planet is there. And I know somebody who's got Mars in this particular degree. And so think about that, Mars in Gemini. So somebody who's multitasking. And apply that idea to this degree. So multitasking when it comes to the creation of ideas. Somebody who's got many, many ways and means to understand the nature of reality. Um, and because it's tempting, Mars in Germany, right, think, do, think, do, think, do. That's what Mars in Germany is like. They don't really spend a lot of time contemplating. Well, because Mars is in this particular degree, maybe they should. Maybe what is necessary here is just to say, right, I want to do that. What will happen if I do that? That, 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 and that, and that result will occur. No. No. I know that will happen, therefore there's no point in doing it. Or I know that will happen, and I don't want that result. Or I don't care about that result as much as I care about that result. So, with Mars in Gemini, you have to do something to overcome this um, temptation to try to do more than you can do. And this is how you do that. Before acting, you, you take it through your mind. You just see what the future will be like if that occurs. And put that aside and then try this one and then try the other one. Now, this is quantum mechanics. This is what quantum mechanics is. You hold a position and you examine all the various options you've got before making a resolute, crystallized choice. Right, that is what my reality is. Having considered all the possibilities, I choose this one. So then the Mars is focused in only the way Gemini can focus um, energy, and that is simultaneously thinky-feel, feely-think. Gemini doesn't really know the difference between feeling and thinking. I mean, the rest of us say that Gemini is very mental and thinking and so on. That's, that's not how they are. They they feel thought. And with Mars there, for example, this is just an example of how to experience a degree. With Mars there, they act upon that thinky feeling before consideration. In this degree, it would be wise just to slow that down, internalize this process. Instead of externalizing your quantum choices in life, internalize it, use the power of mind to think things through, and then negotiate a very subtle path towards success. So you can see how the knowledge of the Sabian degree can transform your understanding, in this case of Mars. We could apply another planet. and well, Let's take Venus, for example. If, if 
Venus is in Gemini, then you can fall in love with pretty much anyone if you want to. And you can think it, you can feel it. You, you know, it's the same kind of energy, but with Venus. So instead of falling in love with everyone you meet, you could just you know, fall in love internally and then see where it would take you and, and then actually focus your loving attention on just the one. And then you'll actually you know, have a much better chance of making it work. Thank you.